Well, thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, hey, thank you for coming out. This is awesome. Uh, we uh, had a great time this morning in chapel. We got a lot of great feedback, and we want to just continue the conversation. For those of you who weren't in chapel, we're going to kind of bring it up to speed very quickly, and then we want to jump right in. And we've devoted a bunch of time at the end to get your questions, your thoughts, and your opinions. One quick thing I want to remind those who weren't there at chapel this morning about what the point of a dialogue is, what really the idea behind it is. And it really isn't about changing each other's opinion. What we'd like to do is model the kind of conversation that allows you to understand someone else's opinions more deeply and hopefully even refine their opinions, make their opinions stronger and better, and at the same time give you a better understanding of how a different set of opinions might emerge from a shared set of common core convictions in the gospel of Christ, uh, in our confessional beliefs, and see that those can bear different fruit in different minds. So that's part of the things that we'll be doing as we look at this. Our two key participants are, uh, as you've already seen, Thaddeus Williams and Brad Christensen. Let me just give you a brief introduction to uh, Thaddeus. Um, he's a colleague of mine in the Biblical Studies and Theology Department. Many of you who are students here may well know him as a professor from Theo 1 or Theo 2, and that's one of the places he has the privilege of kind of fulfilling part of his life passion, to be a person who helps enlarge and uh, lead people's concept of God and lead to a greater enjoyment of God as a result of that. He's not only taught here, but he's also taught at a variety of other settings, both Christian and non-Christian, nationally and internationally. He's uh, uh, commonly involved in speaking retreats and churches and other things like that all across the country, and it's a privilege for us to have him here. He's published several books, but the thing that has gotten us interested in having him here tonight is his most recent work, The Justice Revolution, Loving the Oppressed Without Losing the Gospel. And so he has been doing a lot of thinking about this issue of the gospel and social justice, which is really the focus for our dialogue tonight. So we thought it'd be great to have Thaddeus be one of our participants. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brad Christensen. My students are laughing. My students are laughing at me right now because I do not own a smartphone. So I'm really a fish out of water and had to put your code in already once. It kind of freaked I'm just out. waiting for it to blink out and have him have to re-enter the code <laughs> and his whole introduction will just go right out the door. But go ahead. And when machines take over the world, I'm going to be okay. But Dr. Brad Christensen has an MA and PhD in sociology from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, he's been at Biola for 21 years. That's amazing. He teaches courses in global poverty and inequity, race and ethnicity, and urban society. He also is a prolific author author. He, he's written The Rise of Network Christianity, Growing Up in America, The Power of Race in the Lives of Teens, and Against All Odds. I had one person come up to me in chapel and say I was deeply offended that you associated that with the Detroit Lions football team, Against All Odds. But it's actually called The Struggle for Racial Integration in Religious Schools. And uh, Dr. Christensen is also part of a wonderful organization called Matthew 25 that helps at-risk um, immigrants in our country and to help them. So he's not only a scholar, but an activist. We're absolutely thrilled to have both of you with us. So why don't you please come up and join us. Can I just start out by saying my students are getting extra credit? Here's your <laughs> sign-up sheet. Oh. <laughs> I have to bribe my students to come. Mine are getting slightly more extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> so you all heard a really quick synopsis of the things that we uh, heard in chapel this morning. I've asked both uh, Thaddeus and Brad to just give kind of the one minute elevator speech of kind of the distilled essence of what they said in their light mini kind of a 10 minute TED talk that they gave about their perspective on the gospel and social justice. So let me turn it over first to Brad and then to Thad and just give us kind of a one minute shot of, of what you'd like to say. All right, well I talked about how, you know, like anything, when we talk about social justice, we have to root our ideas in scripture and especially the life and teachings of Jesus. And I talked about how Jesus' main message was the inbreaking of the kingdom of God into this broken world. And I made the case that the, this new kingdom of God that broke in has three aspects. One is uh, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and a restored relationship with God through Jesus. The second one is that Jesus built loving, a loving community where people cared for each other, sacrificed for each other, and everyone was included and uh, particularly the poor and the marginalized were cared for. And then third, uh, that he actually confronted systems of injustice. 
And that those, when those three aspects, uh, when the people of God do those three things, the kingdom expands and the world gets better. Okay, great. Thad, how about you? So I was talking about how important it is to get the order right, that we're talking about the gospel and social justice. And I borrowed this principle from C.S. Lewis, and Muehlhoff gave me guff about it, because he said Calvinists aren't allowed to cite C.S. Lewis, which is a whole other duologue we're going to have to have. Um, but, but the basic principle that Lewis articulates in The Weight of Glory is that if you put a first thing first, the second thing will often get thrown in as a bonus. You make a second thing first, you not only lose the real first thing, you lose the second thing too. And so if you make your first thing, everybody has to like me, nobody's going to like you. If you make your first thing being happy, you're going to end up miserable. If a church makes its first thing being relevant, they're going to end up irrelevant. And so I applied that, that principle to how we ask this question. If we keep the gospel, and I defined it from 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, this is the gospel. I, what I pass on to you of first importance about the death and resurrection of Jesus. If we keep that the first thing, then social justice follows and becomes something beautiful. What I'm concerned about in 2018 in the church in America is that we've flipped those so that social justice becomes something else altogether, more colored by what the culture says than how scripture defines justice. So. And hold that mic just a little close to your mouth and the speaker will be happier. Sure. Uh, so quick question for both of you guys. I mentioned this at the end of chapel and I wanna follow up on now and deliver the goods. Um, I'd just like to know how you can possibly defend having two white males talk about social justice. <laughs> So why don't you feel back when Thad, I'll let you go first uh, since uh, Brad went first last time. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a great question. And I guess the first thing I'd say is uh, th there's a kernel of truth to the concern that if you're talking about things like oppression, wouldn't it be worth hearing from people who are actually oppressed, right? And on that score, I would say amen. Uh, the Bible calls us to grieve with those who grieve and you aren't gonna be able to grieve with grieving people if you've got your fingers in your ears, right? Uh, so I would say listening to the oppressed is a very important part of the conversation. Um, so this night isn't the end all be all of how to think about justice. There's bigger conversations uh, with people who have experienced a heck of a lot more oppression than I ever have. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is um, ideas and truth don't have melanin and they don't have an X or Y chromosome. And what I mean by that is uh, the laws of aeronautics. If, if you took off from LAX right now, then you fly over the ocean. Uh, if you pass over a continent that doesn't believe in those laws of aer aeronautics, your plane isn't gonna plummet up to the ground, right? The, the laws are facts that are independent of whether we believe them or not and the skin color or the gender of the people who articulate them. And I think that's an important point because um, you can take everything I'm going to say tonight and everything I said this morning and take those syllables out of Thad's mouth and put them in the mouth of somebody like Rosaria Butterfield or somebody like uh, Sidney Callahan, the great pro-life feminist, or somebody like Tom Sowell or uh, Trillia Newbell. You can take a complete different gender, completely different ethnicity and make all the same points because uh, we need to be thinking in terms of, is this idea faithful to scripture? Is this idea objectively true? Rather than playing a game of, I'm gonna write off what's being said purely based off the gender or um, appearance of the person making the point. Okay. And how about you, Brad? Um, yeah, so I would say that, well, so I'm a big sports junkie, and I listen to uh, sports radio on the way to work all the time. And when they um, have analysts, sports analysts on there, they always have people who have actually pl played professional sports, right? Um, every once in a while, there's just a person who's good at broadcasting that they throw in there. Um, but I feel like... A conversation is going to be limited if people haven't actually experienced what you're talking about, what you're analyzing. And uh, to me, the conversation about social justice is about system, systems that disadvantage people and systems that oppress people. And if the two of us have never experienced systemic injustice, we're going to miss some things. 
And it's not to say that we can't have thing, valid things to say about it, and, and we, could, you know, we can talk about our experiences of being advantaged by systems, and that, that's valuable. So it's not like nothing we say here is, is valid or valuable. But um, in order to get at the truth, and I agree with that, you know, we, our goal is to, to seek the truth, but we can't seek the truth if we don't have all the perspectives in the room. Uh, and so uh, it would be better if this conversation had more perspectives and actually had people who faced the things that we're talking about. Yeah, and I would just, I teach in our communication department and um, we borrow from a man named Dwight Conkergood who was trying to help us, how do you talk about diverse topics in today's cultural setting? And he came up with two very in interesting terms. One is what he called the curator's exhibitionism, which means I'm a white male, I can talk about anything. I got a PhD, I can address any social issue, I can step right in, it doesn't matter if I'm female, it doesn't matter if I'm oppressed, it doesn't matter, I can step right in. He said, that's an exhibitionist. But on the flip side, he said, there's what he calls the skeptic's cop-out, which is, listen, I'm not female, I I'm not gonna talk about any gender inequity, I I'm a white male, I'm never gonna talk about uh, those who are uh, oppressed. He said, that's a cop-out. So those of you who are in positions where you can study things and talk about things, it's your duty to talk about them. Now, I would agree it'd be better if I was a person who had personally experienced certain things. I get migraines, and my neurologist, so I was having a really bad month, and I said to my neurologist, by the way, what do you do with your migraines? And she looked at me, she said, oh, I don't get them. And I must say, there was just a moment I looked at her like, wow. But she said, but I've, I've studied it all my life and I've talked to a thousands of migraine sufferers. I think I have an insight into it. So what we wanna do is not do the skeptics cop out, which is we couldn't get the diversity we wanted, thus we won't talk about it. And just know, we've, we continue to do our due diligence to make things diverse, which sometimes is a struggle here, but so we're doing the best that we can, but the opinions of these two gentlemen, scholars, is something that we really do need to listen to as we seek to bring in a diversity of voices. And one quick thought on that as well. The interesting thing about the duologue isn't necessarily to gain all of the insight to be had about the particular topic. It's actually the key thing here is to get two people who share a common set of core beliefs and commitments, but who disagree on some important areas of personal conviction. That's the real qualification here. And we're modeling, in effect, how to have those sorts of difficult conversations that is somewhat independent of just an investigation into social justice, because that isn't exactly what the duologue is for. It isn't a uh, uh, you know, YouTube primer on issues related to social justice, but rather this is a question of modeling. How do we manage and navigate deeply felt areas of, of disagreement? And Tim, one of the things that you often talk about is the importance of where these ideas come from. So uh, let me turn it back to you and you can pursue that. What we wanted to do is kind of help you understand the personal journey of these two individuals. Um, the Harvard Negotiation Project says the biggest problem we make in communication, we only share conclusions with each other. We don't share how we arrived at the conclusion. So what we would like to do is just take a few minutes to kind of bring us up to speed on your journey, not just as academics, but also as individuals. Why is this issue important enough that you would agree to do this in front of an audience, talk about uh, social justice? So Thaddeus, why don't you go first and just bring us up to speed personally and academically? Sure, well for me, I spent most of my childhood uh, in potato fields and in orange orchards and strawberry fields uh, working with people who lived in abject poverty because my mom had this amazing ministry called Sunshine Outreach and it was headquartered down south in Orange County and so spending so much time breaking out of the suburban bubble and working hand in hand with people who were in deep poverty and in dire straits uh, had a big shaping impact on me and so we would load up a giant camper and head down south of the border often and hang out and got to know families south of the border where we would, um, I would, my earliest memories are playing marbles in the dirt uh, with kids who literally those marbles were their only toys. Uh, and then coming back to my little cushy suburban Orange County existence and seeing that stark contrast. Um, so thanks to my parents 
the need for justice and seeing huge inequalities was something implanted in me early on. And it was never implanted as like this versus the gospel. It was just an extension of loving Jesus. That went to the next level when I was an undergraduate here back in the early 60s. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> you look great. Thank you. Thank you. There's a little, little Botox going on. Um, for migraines, I'm sure. Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's my sophomore year, the summer between sophomore and junior year, and uh, went over to SMU and applied to go to Nepal. And we spent six weeks, uh, traveled around Kathmandu, uh, traveled around Pokhara, got to hike through the Himalayas, and spend time with Dalits, the untouchable class. You know, you had the caste system there for so long that the overwhelming majority of the popula population was living in abject poverty. And I'll never forget uh, me and five other Biola students pulling up to this little village and seeing people working the, the rice fields. And the pastor we were with said, hey, FYI, those are slaves, like modern victims of human trafficking. And I can't even like put words to it. There was just a darkness that I felt. You could just like almost touch, like sense the evil. The, the injustice was palpable. Um, so that, that was a big part of me caring about justice. Um, and then the more I studied theology, the more I came to see that the gospel is the most precious news that has ever been announced in the history of the human race. And we have to get that right. If we lose the gospel, the church has no reason to exist. We're just a social club at that point. And so the, the more I saw the headlines in the last few years starting to emerge in this term, social justice is all over the place. You can't scroll through your Facebook newsfeed without seeing it 50 different times pop up. And so it, the Holy Spirit really laid heavy on my heart the need to speak into this theologically so we have clarity. What is social justice if we're shaping our worldview by scripture? versus the kind of things that are being called social justice in the 21st century and the need for crystal clear um, view on that. And the name of your book that you're writing, you're in the process? Uh, it's called? tentatively called uh, Justice Revolution, uh, Loving the Oppressed Without Losing the Gospel. Great. So there's my shameless commercial. I did it for you. <laughs> I, I absolutely did that for you. All right, so for me, I grew up in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, anybody here from Colorado? Represent. Yeah. Right. Okay. Brad, we both went to Colorado State, we actually. Went at the same time, huh? Or Brad, I went skydiving on my honeymoon in Littleton, Colorado. I did. It's, I, felt, I felt compelled to say that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> my bad. Go ahead. Skydived into a suburb. That's kind of weird. So, um, uh, so anyway, I grew up in Colorado in the 70s and 80s, and um, it was a very sort of homogenous, white, middle-class community. Um, both my parents uh, had college degrees. Uh, three out of my four uncles were college professors. Um, so I grew up with a lot of advantages. I went to schools that prepared me well, well for college. My um, parents expected me uh, to go to college, and it, was, it wasn't a matter of um, if you go to college, it's when you go to college. Um, so all these things were just built into me. You know, I had a lot of support from my teachers. They believed in me and encouraged me a lot. Um, and I wasn't actually that motivated of a student. Um, I played a lot of video games. I went skiing a lot. I goofed around with my friends a lot. Um, but somehow I got into the two major universities. I, I had a 2.7 GPA in high school. Got into the two major universities, Colorado State and CU Boulder. Uh, without having done a whole lot uh, in terms of homework. And uh, so all that to say, I um, grew up, yeah, with a, with a lot of advantages. And, and I, um, I grew up a Christian as well. I grew up in a Presbyterian church. Uh, both my parents were believers. And we, uh, I had a really awesome youth group, uh, that youth pastor that really challenged me to live out my faith. And uh, so I went to Colorado State University because that's where all my friends were going. It had nothing to do with what I was going to study or anything. Um, but so I, I started out and, and then I continued doing Christian ministry or Christian clubs on campus. Really kept growing in my faith individually. 
And it wasn't until I changed my major to sociology in my uh, junior, well, actually it was social science, but I took my first sociology class junior year that my world exploded. Because I, for the first time I realized that not everybody had the same life that I had in terms of growing up. Uh, Cause we tend to do that as humans, right? We generalize from our own experience. And my attitude whenever I would hear about poverty was because I thought, you know, everybody pretty much has the same experience. Well, they must not be trying very hard because look at me, yeah, you know, I'm going to college and I'm not trying that hard actually. And, and so um, to learn that one out of eight people in the world actually don't have enough food to eat. Um, the fact that in my own city, uh, the way policing works, a lot, another thing about my high school, there was just sort of a lot of substance abuse at my high school and everybody knew who the drug dealers were and um, I never heard once of somebody getting arrested uh, for drugs. But knowing, learning my sociology class how policing works and if I was in a different neighborhood, there'd be a lot of people getting arrested. Um, learning about, yeah, people growing up in poverty in my own city that just didn't have any of the opportunities that I had. Uh, and what, so for one thing, it just blew me away that I didn't know about this. Uh, it took my junior year in college to learn about the injustice that were, that were happening in my own city. And secondly, I grew up in the church my whole life. Uh, nobody ever gave a sermon about justice. Nobody ever talked about injustice. Uh, and that really led me to a crisis of faith because I saw the suffering in my, and it took my non-Christian professors, some of whom were uh, actually anti-Christian, to expose this world to me. Again, it seemed like they cared more about this broken world than the people I grew up in church with. Uh, and so that led me to a crisis of faith. Not, I always knew God was there, um, and I, I wasn't gonna abandon that belief. But the church, as I had experienced, seemed irrelevant because if the church doesn't, either A, doesn't know about the brokenness and the suffering and injustice in the world, um, that's a problem. Or B, if they, don't, if they know and they don't wanna talk about it or care, uh, that's a big problem. And, and so I was introduced to, thankfully, some authors from the evangelical tradition like Ron Sider and Tony Campolo that taught me, no, actually God does care about this and actually it's throughout the scriptures. And so it sort of blew me away that I'd been going to Bible studies my whole life and somehow I missed this and somehow my pastors were missing this. And so it, it sort of became this question in my life, how do we wrestle with um, what scripture says to do as God's people in this broken and suffering unjust world? So great so interesting to see where, you know, influences that lead to lead to you know the perspectives we have. You guys have now, we spent three or four hours together uh, one evening talking about your perspectives. You've heard each other give TED Talks and some things here now. Um, we noticed this morning there were a lot of things that you said that you agreed with each other about. On the other hand, I know there's some things that you have some more fundamental disagreements about. And what I'd like to do is give each of you about five minutes, and if you start to go to eight or 10, I may do this funny thing with my hands to say, okay, let's <laughs> tighten it up a little bit. But just take a few and say, okay, I've heard what, for example, Thad has said, but here's some concerns I might have about that, or here's some questions I have about the position I hear coming, and then we'll, we'll flip it around the other way. Um, and you I, mean to go? Yeah, you can go first if you'd like. Yeah, I guess uh, one of my concerns is when we say gospel, the gospel simply means good news, right? If we take a biblical command, like do justice, right? we talked about that this morning, that's not a suggestion, that is a command. It's an essential if we're living under the whole counsel of God. Good news isn't a command, right? If I tell my daughter, like, eat your broccoli, <laughs> it's not good news, I'm giving her a command, right? Even if I give a command like, love your neighbor, that's not good news. That's an, there's a difference, in other words, between an imperative statement, a command, and an indicative statement like good news. Like, your broccoli's been eaten would be good news, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you get ice cream for dessert is good news. And, and so for me, that's huge. 
that the gospel is an announcement, it's an indicative, it's not a command to do justice. That command follows from once we've been transformed by the gospel. But I think this is where, again, we need that razor sharp precision. And here's what, what I would want to hear your, your take on, Brad, is when I look at the book of Galatians, Paul just comes out kind of guns blazing, right? He's saying there's this different gospel, it's a different Jesus, it's a counterfeit Christ. If an angel from heaven preached a different gospel, let them be eternally accursed. Uh, so he is just railing against what in the first century was the Judaizer heresy, that if you are going to be saved, the good news isn't the announcement of the death and resurrection of Jesus, so you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Rather, the gospel is Jesus plus dietary restrictions. Eat this, don't eat that. The gospel is Jesus plus go get circumcised. And the minute you add that plus sign to the gospel, according to Paul, is the minute you have what he calls a different gospel. And so I guess that's one of my concerns when I hear some of the language that's thrown out, and I'm not accusing you of you know, being a damnable heretic or anything like that. That's not well, thank you. <laughs> you know, just start, just so we're clear, uh, just so you're feeling the love here. Um, but, but I think we do get really sloppy with our language sometimes. So if we say social justice is, quote, a gospel issue, what, what do we really mean? D do we mean that unless you're doing so social justice, you aren't saved? Do we mean that if I have 60 seconds in an elevator to share the gospel, I have to talk about immigration and racism and institutions that need to be reformed? Uh, what do I actually mean when I say social justice is a gospel issue? And on the most charitable read of that I can give, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that if you're really transformed by the gospel, then that should manifest itself in a life that cares about the poor and marginalized. Versus what I don't think you're saying and, and hope you're not saying is the gospel is salvation through the blood of Jesus plus all of your efforts to reform broken systems. And so that, that to me is, is no small issue. Because, and let me just set it in a quick 60 second, give me 60 seconds to take you through 2000 years of church history on this and why it matters. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> time, time is clicking, is, is talking here. Here we go. First century, Jesus versus the Pharisees on the gospel. The Pharisees are adding a mile long list of do's and don'ts. Fast forward late first century. Paul is now going toe to toe with the Judaizers who are adding to the gospel. Uh, fast forward to the fourth century. This guy Pelagius comes around, a British monk, and he's saying, no, we have the power to more or less save ourselves by making good choices and doing good for our neighbors. And Augustine rises up and declares, no, the good news is that you're saved by grace and grace alone, the finished work of Jesus plus nothing. Fast forward to the 16th century, the Catholic Church at the time is preaching, here's you know, a mile-long list of do's and don'ts that you need to keep in order to earn your salvation. And God raises up guys like Luther and Tim's favorite, John Calvin, and all these guys that come around and preach, uh, <laughs> and preach Time's the up. gospel. <laughs> this is rigged, this is rigged. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the Protestants recovering? The sense that we learn from scripture alone that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, so God and God alone gets the glory. And so what you see is this pattern through church history where we keep sliding from the good news into trying to add something to it. And God continually raises up a new generation to say, hey, let's be crystal clear on the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so when I see a generation that I'm encouraged by here at Biola that cares about justice issues, there is a concern that, well, let's just not repeat the mistakes of the past where we are now saying salvation, the gospel equals Jesus plus all this stuff we do to fix society's broken structures. Great, thank you. Hey, so let's do this. Let's, let's not waste that, that was so rich. Let's have you respond real quickly to what that is said, yeah. and then you'll get to say your concern and you'll get to respond. But let's not lose your train of thought. As long as you don't cut him off. Like <laughs> <laughs> I like this, Rick. I like this. Okay, it's it doesn't good, work. It? it doesn't work, but I like it. <laughs> good, Brett. All right, so first of all, I'd just like to 
uh, let the air out of the balloon and say that I believe that salvation, if we're, if we're talking about eternal life and a relationship with God, is by faith alone, not by works. And um, there's no way we can do enough social justice to be righteous enough to earn our salvation. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, what is the gospel, I think, is, is, is a question. Um, and to me, the, the primary message of Jesus, his whole central message was the expansion of the kingdom of God. And uh, now the, the kingdom of God breaking in is what he preached. He preached the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the free gift, uh, which is central to the expansion of that kingdom. And that's by grace alone. Um, but the kingdom is the good news that he talked about. And so um, the, the word gospel just means good news. And uh, in the Roman Empire where he lived, people would understand that as a term that the Romans, when they would conquer a territory somewhere else, they would come in and blow a trumpet, stand up in the courtyard and say, good, hear the good news. We just conquered, you know, the island of Crete or something like that. And, um, you know, the people in those areas would probably go, yeah, that's not that good news for us. I mean, good for you maybe, but uh, it doesn't help us. We're being oppressed by you. And Jesus is basically saying, no, this new kingdom is coming in. Uh, and it's good news for the poor. And it's the good news for the, the people that are being oppressed by this other government. Um, there's new good, good news that, A, you have salvation and you have eternal life and a restored relationship with God. Um, but also, I'm bringing in this new kingdom where loving your neighbor is the primary uh, principle rather than oppression. And, and most people in, in his uh, neighborhood knew oppression. And so um, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of coming in is, yes, that free gift of salvation and eternal life and restoration of our relationship with God. But it's more than that. It's reconciliation with the oppressor and oppressed through changing systems, through enemy love, through loving our neighbor as ourselves. Um, it's restoring systems like government uh, to their original purpose. And that's never going to be perfect. And that's never going to, uh, that full reconciliation isn't going to happen until Jesus comes back. Um, but it's a fuller bodied project than just um, getting our salvation, getting our eternal life worked out, and even our personal relationship with God here and now. And that's central. And, and I agree that uh, if we lose that, we're done, because that's, uh, that's the center of the whole thing. But it's bigger. It, and, and I guess the gospel that I heard growing up was a truncated gospel. It was um, connect with God, develop this great relationship with God, which was awesome. That changed my life. Um, but it didn't do anything for my neighbors. It didn't do anything uh, for me as a, a privileged person to be reconciled with uh, the people that aren't as privileged as me. And, and it didn't give me anything to do while I'm here on earth other than um, connect with God and then tell other people about God. There's a whole project of the kingdom that, that's left out of that, um, that truncated form, I would argue. That's great. So we'll give you a second to respond. Why don't you say what your concern is, and then that is can respond to what you perceive the concern is. Yeah, well, I guess my concern is that by saying it's the gospel, which you define as forgiveness of sins and restored relationship with God and eternal life, is the first thing and everything else is secondary. Uh, it makes it pretty easy to just forget about the rest. And I guess that's what I experienced growing up and I see it in a lot of the church. And it actually hurts uh, the reputation of the church and God because it looks like we don't care about people. Uh, it looks like we don't care about justice. And we end up actually um, reinforcing these structures of oppression because we don't challenge them. And uh, especially if we're um, people who benefit from them, we just sort of stay silent about it. And so, and, and that's what I see in our culture today is, um, you know, forget those Christians. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about uh, women's rights. They don't care about um, mass incarceration or families getting separated at the border. They, they just want to get people saved. So, um, for their eternal life. So uh, there's a danger in neglecting all that stuff too that, that I hope you agree with. But the, um, by defining it that way, I think it means this is the main thing and if, oh, we get around to doing this other stuff, then um, that's a bonus, but it's not really essential. Yeah, yeah, I, 
100% agree that a individualistic, I, Jesus died so I get to float off to the clouds when I die, is an inadequate gospel, a truncated gospel. I 100% I agree with that. Um, I guess the difference for me where we're maybe talking past each other a little bit is, you know, you use that language of truncated gospel or incomplete gospel. Um, if we look at Acts 2, Peter stands up on Pentecost and preaches the gospel. And I reread it a couple times this week and I'm looking for anywhere in there where he's pointing to the systems that were all around in the Roman Empire. I mean, there's a, there's a historian named Margaret Killengray who did the math on it and she, she calculated that roughly two thirds of the Roman Empire were slaves. They're either born into slavery or fell into debt and went into slavery or some other means, but two thirds, that's a mind blowing statistic. And so this is happening in the context when Jesus is announcing the kingdom. And I don't hear him say, well, we need to take down the Roman systems that are oppressing two thirds of the entire Roman empire. Now I'm not saying that wouldn't be an implication of his teachings, but when I hear him talk kingdom, uh, I don't see him saying, here's, here's the system and the gospel, the good news is go change that system. And so it, back to Acts 2, when Peter's preaching the gospel, it's the same as it is in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. You can be saved by grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So I guess my question back to you is, do you believe Peter's sermon in Acts 2, which makes no reference to any systems, or reforming any systems is, in your words, a truncated gospel. Well, I, I just think we're talking past each other because we're defining terms differently. Um, I'd say that the, the, the center of the kingdom is, is that. Um, and it, you know, the, it is good news, it is gospel that, that you know, we have the forgiveness of sins through the death of Jesus. But Paul also talked about uh, reconciling Greek and Jew, for example. In, in Ephesians 2, he talks about, uh, you know, by faith we've been saved, by grace. Um, but then he goes on and he continues and said, uh, we, the reason for, one of the reasons for the death of Christ is to, to reconcile Greek and Jew and, and eliminate the wall of hostility. And then you see um, in Paul, uh, he talks about, you know, in Christ there's neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female. So that all has implications uh, for social systems. And I think that Paul's method of social change isn't to sort of burn it all down and then start over. It's again, what Jesus did is he started this new society that's overlaid onto the Roman empire and the injustices there. And as this, this um, kingdom grows, then you end up challenging the systems, um, which is what happened with slavery, for example. When Paul uh, talks to Slave owners so and, and let, slaves. Let okay. me do the short thing okay. here because I, t two reasons. Number one is that we've got a lot of other questions and you guys will have time to do that. And so we're going to put up here uh, uh, the text number that you could text questions that you have too. And we have uh, Brian Chuck and I don't know whoever else will be doing a little bit of processing of those kind of things, but we'll be able to pick those up and we'll start doing that in about 10 or 15 minutes. So I wanted to get your wheels turning on that so you know where. Let, let me to give go the number those. for people on the sides. The number is 562 562 203 Arminianism. No, 562 203. <laughs> no, that's your phone number. You are, that's, that's my you. phone number. <laughs> one one two zero five six two two zero three one one two zero. We should not have sat next to each other. We should not have done that. Can I interject a question real quick that I had this morning? So, Brad, you started your TED talk by mentioning when Jesus kind of gives his opening pitch. Uh, can you refresh our memory of what that was? And then I, I wanted to get your response on that, it, it, of what you think Jesus is doing there and how that fits in with your interpretation of what the, what the um, central 
characteristic of the gospel is. So Brad, just bring up speed real quick and then I'd love to get that yeah. thought. So Jesus makes his kickoff speech. Uh, the first speech he makes when he, he launched his ministry, he stands up and reads from the book of Isaiah and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me uh, to preach good news to the poor, um, sight for the blind, freedom for the prisoners, and freedom for the oppressed or something like that. And so, um, yeah, his that inbreaking of the kingdom has social consequences, and, and that is part of the good news of the kingdom, I would say. Sure, a, a couple thoughts. So if you read on just a few sentences later, the same scene, Jesus in the temple unrolls the Isaiah 60 scroll and applies it to himself. He says in the same conversation in front of the same crowd, he says, this text is fulfilled today in your presence. And so here's the question I gotta ask is, it, uh, something we all need to be careful of is that we aren't wearing our goggles to the text and reading our own worldviews and our own presuppositions to the text, but as much as possible to shatter our presuppositions and let the text speak for itself. And so I just wonder if we aren't wearing a set of goggles that says, well, I hear the word poor, I automatically assume material poverty. Or I hear the word captive, and I automatically assume somebody who's literally in economic bondage in a slave system. And, and the reason I think there's more going on in that text than just saying it's social systems is if he's saying this is fulfilled today in your presence, what social system did he, what inequity did he resolve that day? What, what captive, what literal physical slave did he liberate that day? What poor person did he reverse their poverty somehow? What Roman government did he challenge with its unjust two thirds of the population in, in slavery? And, and to, to take the thought a step further, if you read on what he did the rest of that day, he's setting people free from oppression, like demonic oppression. If you read on, he's, he's telling stories about God healing people's bodies and then he's going and he's healing bodies. He's setting people free from the oppression of illness and disease and demons and all that evil. And so the breaking into the kingdom, I wanna be careful that we just don't read in all kinds of, well, he's clearly just talking about structural injustice in the way that we, we might talk about in the 21st century. I think his, the scope of his liberation that he's unleashing is deeply spiritual and has multi, multiple facets to it. One of the things that people bring up a lot, and I've heard uh, this mentioned on campus, uh, is a connection between modern social justice uh, perspectives and neo-Marxism. Um, there's, uh, and the common response I hear to that is simply, dude, if I got some flag in my backyard with a hammer and a sickle on it that I don't know about, I mean, why in the world are you accusing me of being a Marxist just because I'm an advocate for social justice? So Thad, again, I'm gonna do the squeezy thing here, but in a short period of time, can you explain why people say that, bring up this neo-Marxist connection, um, and why, and if that is a thing that you have concern about at all, or if you think that's the straw man, and then depending upon what he says, Brad, you may want to say a few words of response to that. How much time we got? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, Marxism as a system has certain built-in presuppositions that at the end of the day are fundamentally incompatible with the biblical view of the world. For example, for Marx, and I'll get to neo-Marxism, the idea is that you don't have a sin nature you aren't fallen, you aren't dead in sin, you don't need a savior, you don't need regeneration from the Holy Spirit. The source of all evil is inequity, economic disparities, the difference between the haves and the have-nots. That's the underlying problem. So if we change the structures, if we overthrow the capitalist structures that create inequality, then we can create utopia, we can create heaven on earth. And of course, the 20th century experiments in trying to equalize rich and poor had a death toll over 100 million. And so Marxism had to pivot in the 1960s, and this happened to be called neo-Marxism, the newest version of it, uh, with what's called the Frankfurt School, guys like Herbert Marcuse and others, and their pivot was to do this. Marx said, we don't have a sin nature, the real problem is economic disparity between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, 
well, we can't play that game anymore because the body count's too darn high in the 20th century. So we need to redefine justice here. So instead of just the economics haves and have nots, let's play this identity politics game where we can now make everything about the oppressor versus the oppressed. And so that's just a quick snapshot of what people mean when they talk about cultural or neo-Marxism. It's where everything is seen through the grid of oppressor versus oppressed. And if I could just have 30 more seconds on that. What that looks like in our culture and where it actually is entering into a lot of Christian conversations about this is what I call the tribes mentality. Tribes, for so those of you who had me in class, you know I'm all about the acrostics, right? So, so tribes, you see everything through these lenses. T, you're just a theocrat, somebody trying to push your Christianity through the force of law down everybody's throats. R, it's racism. Um, I, it's you're an Islamophobe. Uh, B, you're a bigot. E, you're an elitist capitalist. Or S, you're a sexist. And that's a neo-Marxist way of viewing the world where that becomes the grid through which you interpret all of reality. And when we're seeing the world only in those categories, oppressed or oppressed in one of those ways, we end up hurting a lot of people that we're actually trying to help. So, so Brad, what were your thoughts to be on that? Wow. Well, that's a, a lot to respond to. Um, I would just say, um, just to get, bring it back to Jesus, um, I mean, instead of, um, I guess what I see is, people sort of talking about some of the justice work that, that believers do and saying, well, somehow tainting that with the neo-Marxist label. Um, and instead of, instead of deciding whether something's neo-Marxist or not, I think we, we ought to decide whether it's biblical or not. And sometimes Jesus, would have, Jesus addressed racism, Paul addressed racism, uh, economic inequality, and so, um, you know, we can argue about how to do that in ways that are biblical. Um, um, Jesus liberated women, right? Um, one of the things he did was he, when he intervened, when the woman was being stoned for adultery, is uh, confronting that injustice of blaming women for sexual sin. So anyway, um, we have these, these inequalities that Jesus and Paul addressed. And so when we address those, we need to do those in a biblical way. But I don't know how helpful it is to um, try to figure out if they're neo-Marxist or not. Let's, let's look at what Jesus and Paul did and see if what we're doing is consistent with that. Yeah, I, I would say it is important to determine. Well, let me, let me clarify one thing. Um, if somebody calls you or, or calls Christians trying to help people, oh, beware of the neo-Marxism. That doesn't necessarily mean you're sitting down with, you know, Marx in front of you and, and Herbert Marcuse on the other hand, you're just deliberately, like, directly using that as your divine authoritative source of revelation or anything like that. Um, it means there's a flavor of the way justice is being defined in a lot of Christian circles that is basically the same stuff they were saying, even if you haven't read them directly. Even Can if you define no that? Lineage. Because I hear that, but I've never heard anybody actually specify what's neo-Marxist about what Christians are doing right now. Sure. Um, the identity game, where as we... Can you explain the identity game? Because that's another thing that gets thrown out there, but nobody ever defines it. Sure, sure. <laughs> it, it's, it's the idea that when I look at a person, if I'm looking through neo-Marxist lenses... I don't see the individual before me. I see an avatar or a cipher or an exemplar of the entire people group that they represent. And this is, this is on campus. This is a real thing here where if you look at somebody, because it's so in the air we breathe now in the culture, cultural Marxism has become that pervasive. It's in the media, it's everywhere. 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had to start a duologue with a question like, how come you're white and you're talking about this? There's a... There's a there, there's a racial, yes, Jesus talks about racism, and he's against racism, but he topples it in a way that is diametrically opposed to the way a neo-Marxist would make race a fundamental category of identity and then pit everybody against each other in a Marxist class struggle. Jesus brings reconciliation by transcending race, by giving our deepest identity in Christ, so that now our race 
isn't erased, but actually enhances something beautiful and cherished in a unified community. That's the opposite of Marxist class struggle and neo-Marxist class struggle. I guess I would just, uh, I mean, if there are people looking at someone and only seeing their race, I would be against that. I don't know that I see that. I don't know that I see what you're seeing, what you're describing on this campus. That if I look at someone who's white, oh, that's a white person, I don't, I'm not gonna listen to them. Um, what I see is people um, understanding that if we talk about race, uh, it's a difficult topic. Um, and a lot of times white people dismiss the pain and the experience of oppression that people experience and the inequalities that they experience. And so there's a, a reluctance uh, sometimes to have those discussions dominated by white people. And so that's something different than saying, I don't like white people because I'm, they're the oppressor and I don't want to talk to them and I only see them because they're white. Um, I think it's a little bit of a, a caricature um, of what's actually happening here. Let, let me just push back a little bit. Um, what I was talking about, the neo-Marxist idea, you asked me like specifically, what does that mean? How do you see it here? And my, and my answer is when you don't see the actual image bearer of God in front of you with their unique story, their unique traumas, their unique issues, their unique gifts, their unique beauties, but you begin classifying them, um, the minute you do that, you, you lose the actual human being you're talking to and you're making all kinds of assumptions. In other words, I like how you said, let's bring it back to Jesus. Let's bring it back to Jesus. He always deals with people as individuals. He's in their story. And so take uh, my old neighbor, who's a white dude. Uh, if we're looking through cultural Marxist lenses, he's got a big house, he's got a 2,800 square foot house, he's got a Mercedes, and people would just look at that and we would be trained to think, oh, privilege. The assumption is he's an avatar of an entire pri privileged people group. If you talk to him, he spent his entire childhood hiding in the forest of the Soviet Union because his family loved Jesus and the government was out to kill them. He experienced systemic oppression from a communist atheist government his entire life and had to come here and, and scrounge from nothing. But there's assumptions that are made all the time. And, and that's just one, one final point, and I'll quit hogging the mic here. Um, but the categories that are given to us that I laid out where it's you know either theocracy or racism or sexism, and these are the categories of oppression that, that are all over our radar. The problem is I was talking to a student today who is deeply oppressed by issues that I won't go into, but doesn't fit into any of those boxes. There are people in this room who have all different skin tones and because we're raised in a fallen world, we've all experienced oppression. If, if you were raised in a two-parent home, you have an enormous privilege over people who weren't. If you endured abuse as a child, you have levels of oppression that will haunt you for a long time and can experience healing through Jesus. So what I'm saying is the neo-Marxist categories tend to be these three or four categories. And then when you tell people an entire people group, well, therefore you don't understand suffering. I've talked to people across the board, all different skin colors, and because we're in a fallen world, we all got damage. And when we can have that conversation versus being in the victim Olympics, uh, we get a lot further. Okay. I gotta respond to that, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, uh, go, respond. Hey, as Dr. As Dr. Christensen is, is gonna give his response, please text in questions, feel free to go do that, but yeah, go ahead. I hope you would agree that racism exists. Absolutely, and it's horrible and wrong and unbiblical. When, when you say, you look at a person, when, when we, I guess, uh, who are, are interested in the issues of social justice, we look at people and we only look at their skin color, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't, I don't know people that do that, I guess. That only look at people at their skin color. We're, we're all a, we all have multiple identities, right? Um, but if you're not willing to see a person of color, let's say an African-American person, as an African-American person, you're denying their identity. That's who they are, that's who God made them. And their experiences and their culture. And I would never deny that identity. 
Well, you're, you're talking about, well, we got to look at people as individuals. You can't look at their rays. You can't look at their skin color. That's who they are, and their experiences no, 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 are no, no, no. largely uh, affected by those things. Well, that's what I heard you say. I'm it? saying you see that person in all their unique God-given beauty and diversity yeah. and their skin color. Everything that God built into that person, you see, you appreciate as an image bearer of God. What I'm arguing against is looking at the outside, judging the book by the cover and saying, you therefore have all the qualities, for better or worse, of this entire people group. That's the kind of thing where you have privilege yeah. because of the melanin in your skin or you have experienced mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z because of, you can't let yeah. people be avatars of their people group. You yeah. have to love them as individuals and all their distinctions. No, no, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me, but, so, but let me address one more thing. When you talk about the victim Olympics, that completely dismisses people who have experienced pain and suffering. That's not my intention. Well, any stretch when you of the use those terms, that's what people hear. I, I'm just telling. You. If anybody in the room heard that, I apologize from the core of my being. That's that's not my intention. So, let me oh. let's pick up. <laughs> There's one of the questions here that we've had texted in that picks up on something closely related to the theme you guys are talking about, and you may want to pick up. I know there's things you'd love to say, and this may attach here too. We've talked a little bit about this issue of group. Ident or identity politics and things like that. Brad has earlier mentioned issues related to systemic um, sins and structures of injustice. A thing that I've also heard that is somewhat in this vein is the idea of generational issues. Is this uh, person I'm saying, what are your thoughts on, quote, generational repentance? The idea that we must repent for the sins of supposed ancestors who may have done racial oppressive acts towards one another. Uh, I, I've heard this stated in a variety of ways about it feels like we're, our thoughts about racism are fundamentally backwards looking. I want to look back at what happened before. I'm being called to repent, but these aren't things that I did. These are things a different generation did. So somewhat similar to the systemic issue, we have a generation one. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, if I could just say that, I don't hear um, African-American folks talking about slavery and wanting to have us apologize for slavery. What they're talking about is the injustices they face right now. And they may be related to slavery, and, and they're related to the history, that whole history. Um, they're talking about getting stopped by the police on the way home. And so, um, and they're talking about, uh, yeah, being isolated and not um, maybe getting promoted at their job because they're not in the social networks of the people that are. So there's, there's all kinds of issues, and I, I don't know why, um, that's a perception that somehow um, we're getting, um, that somehow our jobs to apologize for things we didn't do. I, the, I, I believe that it's all of our jobs, no matter what our background is, is to seek equality for people so people can um, have equal opportunities to thrive now, in the here and now. Now, if that's related to the ideas that came out of slavery, we need to talk about that. But yeah, I don't, I don't see a backward looking from uh, at least the, the most of the people of color that, that I interact with. It's about the here and now. So we've gotten a tremendous amount of questions. Thank you so much for doing that. So let's popcorn <laughs> these. Let's just popcorn these and, and not have both of you respond to a question, but we'll just, so uh, Thaddeus, here's one that is specifically to you. How does one practically put the gospel first while still acting toward change in our society? What does that look like? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, let me tell you what it, looks like in my life. Uh, I know my own tendencies to try to justify myself. I know that because I still have this thing called the, the sarks, the sin nature, the flesh, that there's a part of me that resists the gospel every day and can so easily lose sight of it and slide back into some kind of works-based salvation system. And so for me, putting the gospel first means I, I have to preach it to myself every day. And, and when I'm driving up the freeway to class, what am I doing? A lot of the time I'm preaching the gospel to myself. And so I'll just run through the ABCs of the atonement. Jesus, you're my atoner. B, you're my battlefield hero. C, you're my chain breaker. D, you're my defense attorney pleading my not guilty sentence. E, you're my eternal priest. F, you were the forsaken son in my place. And Acrostics I, gone wild. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I found that when I'm not preaching the gospel on the closest mission field to me, my own heart, 
then I don't preach it to anybody else. I, you, we're all evangelists for whatever you're enjoying, right? If you discover this show on Netflix, you gotta check out you know, Ozark or whatever, it's amazing. And you get people turned on to shows because you enjoy them. And when you're enjoying God by preaching the gospel to yourself and just receiving all of that grace daily, you're enjoying God and so you can't help but, but talk to people about it. So as the overflow of that, as the gospel come to, comes to transform you and you come to see yourself as saved by the grace of God, it becomes really difficult to see somebody who's oppressed, somebody who's suffering, somebody who's an outsider, somebody who's marginalized, and not have a spontaneous like magnetic pull, pull to show the grace of God into their life. And if I can, I know. I, okay. All right, we'll leave it there. I have one for Brad that right. I, think is, I think is just great. Um, Brad, how do we know when we've made another gospel or God out of social justice? What are the telltale signs that maybe that's happening? Well, the, maybe you're not talking to the God anymore, or maybe you're not um, communicating with him and, and reading his word, and you're, you're too busy um, you know, trying to change the systems uh, to do that. And, and maybe you're not uh, in, a, in a worshiping community. Maybe mm. you're uh, not building the, the community of love that Jesus uh, talked about when he talked about the kingdom coming in. Uh, you know, people who worship together, serve each other, take care of each other. If your life becomes consumed with, with the one part of the kingdom coming in and, and you forget the others, then, um, and that's true of the others too. If you're, if you're, so, if you're consumed with any, any of them um, and you forget about God uh, and in your personal relationship with him, then, then yeah, I think that sort of can block out God in your life. Let me pick up something that probably both of you may want to respond to. You've both talked about in, in different ways the fact that you do value social justice and concerns for these things with the, the differences you mentioned. Um, I wonder if you could tell me how biblical social activism might look different than contemporary secular social activism. Because I think this is one of the concerns people have is that there's a flavor difference it seems like. Do you perceive that to be the case, Brad, or are they really just more or less the same thing and uh, likewise for Thad? No, I think the, the difference would be, and, and some non-Christian folks are, are trying this and, and adopting this, is uh, Jesus' idea of enemy love. That um, your desire is not to defeat your opponent or the people that are opposing you and sort of banish them or uh, relegate them to some inferior status. Now, your desire is to be reconciled to them ultimately. Um, but that means confronting them. And, and you see that through uh, a whole line of believers from the Mennonites to uh, Tolstoy to Gandhi actually adopted, even though he's not a Christian. He was, did a great job of taking the Sermon on the Mount and applying it to social justice. And then Dr. King, Cesar Chavez. Um, that's a different way of doing things when you're actually... Uh, so I'm involved with a group of activists that we actually feel like we're ministering to the people um, that we're challenging. Because basically we're, we're recognizing, hey, we, you're in a dangerous position um, before God because of the stuff you're doing um, by oppressing people. We want to help you uh, seek justice. And, and we're, we're concerned about your soul and we want to uh, love you as a person. And that, that's a different feel than... Um, if you don't have that, it's, it's more about, hey, let's, let's just defeat the people that and are opposing them. in that sense, them. loving them doesn't let them continue to do acts no, of oppression. No, not at all. Okay. And in fact, um, loving them means trying to get them in right relationship with God, which includes how they're treating people. Treating others. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree completely. And I love that you point out enemy love is a mark of justice if we're doing it Jesus' way. And that's... That's such a brilliant insight because it really, for me, when you said that, just the light bulb went off of like, yes, that's what a lot of the things being called social justice nowadays are, are lacking. They're the exact opposite, right? Where you have, I was just reading, um, Christina Fair from Georgetown University tweeted uh, yesterday that every white male should be murdered while feminists look on laughing. They should be castrated and their carcasses fed to pigs. Yeah, but don't, re don't read into that. Um, 
<laughs> this is a tenured professor at Georgetown, right? And Georgetown came out and said, you know, defended her right to, to express her viewpoint. Now that's the kind of stuff, or Antifa, that goes up and maces strangers who disagree with them politically, or um, movements that had in their, their charter, their defining mission, the, the dismantling of the nuclear family. There's all kinds of stuff being called social justice. If you read the UN charter, social justice is equal to government centrally controlled redistribution of wealth. If you look in Venezuela, what is, so, what is social justice? It equals socialism. There's all kinds of ways that term is being thrown around that we need to be super careful if we're gonna retain the term as a body of believers. If we aren't defining stuff, we're just causing all kinds of unnecessary confusion. And I think to Brad's point earlier about, look, people are calling me all kinds of like Marxist names and everything, and I don't really believe any of that stuff. I, I think we'd have a lot more unity on campus if we just took the time to say, hey, when I am talking about social justice, this is what I mean. I don't mean all this stuff over here. I Great think point. we realize there's a lot yeah. more unity on this campus than we realize right now. Uh, here's a question. Let me throw it out to you, Thaddeus. Can I just real quick oh, respond yeah. to that? Of course. Um, we need to be careful as Christians in, in not taking the most extreme example of something and um, sort of making that the, uh, the typical uh, position. And so we get mad about when people do that to us as believers, right? When we, um, people say, oh, look at those Westboro Baptist Church. Um, look at those Christians. Well, look how lame, you know, look how horrible they are. Um, let's not do that to our, uh, let's, let's not, you know, just look on certain websites and, and get the most crazy example and then say, uh, yeah, uh, that's what social justice is. Because the, the activists and the sociologists that I hang out with wouldn't have taken any of those positions. Yeah. Uh, um, one of our core values here at Bio University is that we, we don't want to just keep this on campus. We want to engage broader culture. That's what we hope that all of us, regardless what area we go into, what career we go into, we want to be God's spokespeople. So a person makes an interesting comment. I just want to get your quick take on it, that is. Would it be appropriate to view missions specifically focused around social justice as the way to bring the gospel first to people and build relationships? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't see anything wrong with that. When I went to Nepal, um, <laughs> it, was, it was so backwards the way we did it. We hiked through the Himalayas and, you know, we went trekking a couple days and the mission strategy went like this, like we'll hire some, some porters to carry everything up, all of our junk. They're going to carry our giant heavy backpacks. And then as we're hiking up the mountain, we'll talk to them about Jesus. It's like, we had that exactly backwards. What we should have done is paid them, carried our own stuff, and walked up the mountain telling them about Jesus. And so there's, there's certainly this pattern all over getting back to Jesus in the Gospels where he's, he's healing physical needs. He's valuing people that society devalues. He's hearing the marginalized. He's, and he's giving them a deep sense of your love by the infinite creator. Uh, that's all part of him getting to the good news of his death and resurrection. So one thing that concerns me is that there seems to be among certain pockets this idea to get rid of the term social justice. I've heard, let's replace it with biblical justice. My, I guess my concern with that that I would like for you both to respond to is there, there's good impulses in culture today to do the things, even if they're borrowing from neo-Marxist roots, there's good inclinations today, we would say that's God's common grace, to, to address racism poverty, oppression, and for us as Christians to say, hey, let's form loose connections with you and tackle these things, and as we do that, we can give you a, a biblical motivation for why we're doing it and present the gospel. I'm afraid that if we get rid of the term social justice, then again, and call it biblical justice, again, it seems like we're out of step with the rest of the world, and now we come across ever so slightly as being against social justice. So, so how can we use the good social justice impulses in culture today to actually form connections so that we can actually do both proclamation and social justice. Could you see avenues we could form partnerships with even Georgetown, UCLA, everybody, Berkeley? Absolutely. And that's actually the one thing we have in common with, with a lot of people in our culture right now is at least if we're reading the Gospels, um, the concern for the poor, concern for justice, concern to address unequal and unjust systems. 
And there's a lot of people that are concerned about that that think Christians are on a completely different page. And so in the work, the, some of the activist work I do, that's where I meet. You know, I, I work at Biola. I go to church. I, I don't hardly meet any people that aren't already believers. But doing activist works, um, yeah, you form bonds with people. And you go, yeah, you know, um, represent Christ in those areas. And, uh, and people realize that, oh, yeah, okay, there's, there's different kind of Christians out there. Because what, what their view is, it, a lot, for a lot of people, um, Christians are synonymous with the, the very things that they're trying to, trying to um, address. Trying to eliminate. Yeah. Can I weigh in on that question real quick? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, a, a beautiful example of that, if we hopped in a big time machine together and, and time warp back to the second century, this massive plague just ravages the Roman Empire, wipes out by some estimates a third of the empire drops dead from this plague. Our brothers and sisters in the second century who realized Jesus had taken their sin plague upon himself because they understood the gospel, they didn't just say, well, let's just twiddle our thumbs because I get to go to heaven when I die. When they saw people plagued, dropping dead like flies, they ran to their bedsides and dignified them and took care of them and, and clothed them and more often than not got plagued too and died right alongside of them. Now here's the key is it wasn't, you must first accept a Judeo-Christian sexual ethic or we're not gonna help you, mm. right? It wasn't you must first accept a robust Christian worldview and our definition of the gospel and agree with us on social issues and politics or we won't help you. They led with love, right? And that, Rodney Stark, the great historian, wrote The Rise of Christianity, and he says, what was it that took this small little band, this motley crew? He was a sociologist. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favorites. I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> Stark is my second favorite sociologist. <laughs> and, and Stark's wrestling with this question, how did Christianity blow up and, and become this global phenomena, and his answer after he weighs all the different historical possibilities, he lands on, they just flat out outloved everybody in society. The, the non-Christians of the second century thought, this life is all I got, There's, I die and the worms eat me the end, so if, you, if Mulehoff's over here coughing and I don't believe in an afterlife, I'm running for the hills. Mm -hmm. But if I believe Jesus took my plague upon himself, I'm running towards Tim in spite of his Arminianism. <laughs> I didn't say a word. I did not Let say it that. go, you guys. Let it go. <laughs> we got our next duologue. We've got our next duologue. But, but so, thir 30 seconds, because I got to finish this. Make it 15 and you got a deal. Here's, here's the punchline to it. 10 seconds. Fast forward to the 1980s. A mysterious plague breaks out. People are dropping dead. It's mm, mm. disproportionately affecting the homosexual community. Everybody's freaking out. Why are their immune systems shutting down? And my question is, where was the church in the 1980s? And the answer is, ought to make our guts twist. The church in America in the 1980s was right where the non-church was in the second century, running for the hills away from the plague, and often turning and shouting over our shoulders, that's God wrath, God's wrath coming to get you. And that's some of the stuff behind the whole social justice conversation. There's some sorries that need to be said mm -hmm. if we're going to mm -hmm. be able to make progress. Good. Let me just plug. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Hey, let me just make a plug for a book that has really impacted a lot of us, and that's Rodney Stark's book, The Rise of Christianity, is one of the most influential books I think I've read in the last 15 years. It's just a beautiful book about a sociologist asking the question, what caused the church to grow like it did from a sociological standpoint? It's beautifully written. It's well done. So, yeah, just a great book. Kind of like yeah. The Rise of Network Christianity. Oh, The that. Rise of, yes, yes, by Brad right. Christensen. Yes, The Rise of Network Christianity. <laughs> so let me pick up a question here that actually is represented of several questions I saw as I was looking through these, but kind of more attached to more biblical issues and clarifying some thinking about this. Here's a question. Weren't the Jews of Jesus' time mistaken in thinking that the Messiah was going to be a hero who would free them from Roman oppression? If we think the gospel is centered around social justice, aren't we just repeating their mistake? Ah, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> Very good question. That was the best question so far, I think. <laughs> so, uh, so, not that I'm dissing the other questions. All great questions. But, um, so, this gets at uh, Jesus and Paul's view of how social change happens. 
It's not burn down the structures. It's not take it over through military force. It's to build uh, a community. And, and, and it's like a mustard seed. You start small. And you start living in these communities where you're serving the poor. And you're treating everybody like a brother, whether they're outcasts or not, male, female, Greek, Jew. Um, and then that starts to spread. And that starts affecting how um, people in government work. They, they look on that and go, wow, uh, that's, something, that's something different. Uh, women, uh, well, they're actually treating them as equals. They're not treating them like property. Well, and, and over time, over the centuries, that works its way like leaven into the dough. And, and that actually changes systems. And, and Rodney Stark's book talks about that. And um, so just because we're not raising an army and overthrowing the, the government or uh, th overthrowing capitalism doesn't mean we're not doing structural work. It's just bottom up. It takes a long time and it starts small. It starts in these small, loving Christian communities. So in that sense, the prime mistake they had wasn't so much that the Romans might be displaced, but they would be displaced by military action right. or other direct by force violence. being applied. By violence, yeah. Yeah. Did you have another question? Oh, I, I didn't. I, I didn't. Go ahead. So one of the other things that we have, have talked about before, maybe, yeah, ooh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, as I look at that, let me think, okay. Let me just ask you guys, um, I'll give you each a shot to answer this question. Is there something, Brad, that you would just feel better if Thad would say the following about these things? You know, we, we've had this. <laughs> But are there things that I just wish he would say, or perhaps the opposite, I wish he'd stop saying, but whatever it would be. What, what might you want to say on that? Uh, well, if I, could, if I could wish for Sat, uh, Thad to say anything, um, it would be, <laughs> be that good. reforming unjust social systems is part of our role as the body of Christ. And what would you say to that, Thad? I'd say Amen. Why do we even have this conversation? We're, we're done. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> but I'd say amen with a caveat. Oh. No, you're done. You're already done. A 30-second caveat. A 30-second or less caveat. Go ahead. <laughs> Which systems, and are we going about it loving God with our minds and loving the poor and oppressed by loving God with our minds, by being very clear about what the actual facts at hand are. My church did this thing called Shoeless Sunday where we'd all show up in new shoes and then we'd all leave in our socks and they'd pack up in a big crate all of these brand new shoes and ship them off to Nigeria until we found out what was actually happening. This crate comes parachuting into a village and you just instantly put all the shoemakers in a hundred mile radius out of business and set them economically back 10 years. And so we had to realize like, just because we're trying to fix a broken system doesn't mean we're fixing the system unless we're being really smart using our God-given minds to get at the actual roots of injustice. Great. Thad, are there things that you might look at Brad and say, you know, Brad, I'd feel just a little more comfortable if you'd say or stop saying. <laughs> Oh, man. Marx was wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Um, what I would love to hear Brad say is that the good news is that we're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. And the way Luther famously put it, you're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Meaning, you're saved by trusting Jesus alone, but if it's real saving faith, it will be followed through with action on behalf of the poor and needy. That's, that's the distinction I'm not hearing said, that what saves is the faith alone, but the effect of that is the action. Well, I would wholeheartedly say what Luther just said. Uh, yeah, we're saved by... <laughs> By grace alone, by the blood of the cross, and and but that, what he caveat. Said. Are you gonna have a caveat now? Well, Thirty seconds or less. Go for it, man. Well, the, the caveat is just Luther's. That like, when you are saved, that the, the outflowing of that is is work for justice for the poor and the press. Amen. 
Hey, let me just. Uh, We're all Lutherans then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me just say a bunch of questions uh, had to do with the fact of a desire uh, for wishing that the panel was more diverse. Uh, hear us when we say that we recognize that, and instead of postponing this conversation until we can cultivate, it, it is hard to find, to be honest, faculty who are willing to do what these two participants did, which is to risk talking about a very sensitive issue. And so we, we recognize the diversity issue. We're not unaware of that. But rather than postpone the endeavor to talk about the issue, we just felt like, let's, let's get the conversation going now, and we can make change. We plan on doing this every single semester. Um, the president initiated this a year ago. He just felt like, let's t have these conversations and even model how Christians can have conversations, be convicted, and yet disagree with each other. So let's give our participants a round of applause. So last, oh, oh yes, yeah, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. You so, go, my bad. We, we are wrapping up on this, but let me just pick up on that theme. One of the other things we're saying is the only thing we're doing is not do logs. So uh, one of the important things for us is, is faculty that we're having these conversations. We do some of these things in the context we call table talk, and so our next table talk will be end of October, and it will be a batch of people who have been part of a social justice reading group who will be, in effect, facilitating that conversation, which includes people of various ethnicities and genders and all these sorts of things, a much broader and more diverse group. We have had the previous table, uh, previous dialogue we had included Joy Qualls, who you'll be meeting in just a second again. So let me encourage you to remember that this isn't the be all and end all of this whole conversation, just as Tim mentioned, and we understand there's a whole lot more that needs to be said. But it is always a problem when you say, because we can't do everything, we won't do anything. And so we'd like to do something. And, and that's, I think, what we've uh, taken the opportunity to do here tonight. And I am really grateful for you guys coming out and also you guys being here. So I just turn over to Joy. Did you want to introduce Joy Qualls? Well, oh, I'd love to introduce here? my chair. Yeah. Uh, there you go. So the very first one we did was last year. Again, politics was a huge issue. It was a real risk to get two faculty members to get up and talk about their views of politics and how it interacted with faith. And so we were absolutely thrilled with our participants. And Dr. Joy Qualls, chair of the communication department, did a phenomenal job. We wanted her to come up, uh, add a, just a couple quick comments about the importance of communication, then close us in prayer. So Dr. Qualls. Thank you, gentlemen, for, wow, that's really loud in here all of a sudden. Um, thank you so much for doing this tonight. Um, one of the things that we talk about in the Communication Studies Department is that words don't mean, people mean. And that meaning comes from the things that are inside of us out of the heart the mouth speaks. And I think you got to hear the hearts of some people who really care about these subjects. Um, the other thing I want to, to mention is that in not only are these events not isolated incidents and there's other things happening on campus, but there are places where these things are being taught on our campus, and the Communication Studies Department just happens to be one of them. And there are many places that we partner with other departments in the way that they're doing this. And so this is something you can study. This is something that you can make a career out of. And I think that um, the, the culture that we're living in, uh, the whole time we were, we were talking about this and the subject of culture kept coming back up, I was trained back to that verse in Romans 8.19 that said the earth is literally groaning for the sons and daughters of God to reveal themselves. And our world is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to reveal themselves. And if we don't get this right, we will stand before God and be accountable for this moment that we're living in. And so I encourage you to study these things. I encourage you to seek out not only the faculty that are up here, but the departments where these things are being done. Because we have a job before us, a calling, a holy calling. And if we don't step up, the rocks themselves will cry out. And I would rather be the one kneeling at the throne of God than the rocks outside. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.